On This Week in Enterprise Tech, SpaceX is trying to bring their low-orbit satellites lower in orbit. Plus, we talk about the IT and security conundrum. And Brian Curtis and I talk with Graham Bata from Oracle about high-performance computing. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 340, recorded May 3rd, 2019, the high-performance episode. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Envoy. Envoy builds beautiful, modern software to help businesses elevate the physical workplace experience. With Envoy visitors, you can greet guests with a welcoming, sleek iPad sign-in app while still protecting your people, property, and ideas. Start your free trial today at Envoy.com slash twit and by Pulseway, the ridiculously cool IT management software that lets you remotely monitor and control IT systems from any device. It's enabling busy admins to fix issues on the go and be more productive. Try it free for 14 days at Pulseway.com slash twit. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need a little help from some of the top enterprise tech professionals in the industry, starting with our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi, Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chibert, great to see you. How you been, bud? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good, and thank you so much for your help. Um, Lou has actually been help helping to edu- educate me. This is called the Wheel Link. It was a, originally on Kickstarter quite a while ago. This is an ESP8266 based uh, Wi-Fi dev board, and it has a whole bunch of um, uh, RESTful APIs and so forth. But it also has capability of doing WebSocket pushes. And so I'm using it to go and do occupancy sensors because what we're trying to do is trying to find out if certain floors of buildings even have people going in and out on weekends because we're trying to tone down the air conditioning and save a ton of money uh, running chill towers. Fantastic. Talk about IoT changing the way we do business. That's fantastic. I'm I'm looking forward to actually playing with it myself. I'm going to get myself my own little kind of test board as well. So we'll see how that goes. But folks, we, we can't, we, we want to add to our expert panel because we want to add to the the knowledge base, the brain trust. We have our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, welcome back. It is always a pleasure to be here, Lou. And uh, to sort of get into the whole single board computer thing, I've been playing around a bit. Uh, the local library here in Orlando has a uh, has a makerspace inside, and uh, I've been oh, talking cool. to the staff there. We've been doing things like uh, setting up Guarduino, uh, using Arduino to automate things like watering and uh, sensor readings for your garden. So uh, I'm down here trying to figure out just how high tech my tomatoes and cucumbers can be. <laughs> Fantastic. Now are you now you're heading out pretty soon. You're going to interrupt. Are you coming out to build too, or not this year? Uh, not planning to be at Build, unfortunately, but I will be at Interop. That's uh, about three weeks away, so uh, it is thundering down upon us. Fantastic. Well, um, I've been spending a bunch of time preparing for Build, so hopefully that will turn out okay. A little bit of lack of sleep, but you know, without with even with a little bit of sleep, we're going to have a pretty great show today. Not only we're going to talk about a little bit about how SpaceX is trying to have big bold goals and move their broadband to low orbit. But we have a great guest from Oracle, Karan Bata, to talk about high-performance computing. But before we get into all that goodness, let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, we all know that organizations are aggressively trying to move to the cloud. Now, whether their goal is to enhance their global presence or streamline their workforce, moving to the cloud is, is a pretty big undertaking. Now, the surface is more with moving software systems because the amount of configuration and infrastructure needed to support cloud-exposed systems is, is quite big. Well, Zagetti security consultant Matthew Galee has a lesson to teach the people with this latest exploit of 
SAP software. Now, research done has found that more than 50,000 organizations are open to an exploit that can allow a hacker to steal anything that sits on a company's SAP systems and also modify any information there so they can perform financial fraud, withdraw money, or just plainly sabotage and disrupt the systems. Naming the exploit 10K Blaze because of the threat they expose to business critical applications, which if hacked could result in material misstatements in U.S. financial filings. Ooh, that sounds great. Now, security experts say attacks on those systems could be hugely damaging, both for the victim organizations and the wider supply chain. Sounds scary? Well, think about this. SAP software is used in more than 90% of the world's top 2,000 companies to manage everything from employee payrolls to product distribution and industrial processes. Now, SAP customers collectively distribute 78% of the world's food and 82% of the global medical devices, the company says on its website. So that's some good facts there. Now, SAP has issued a guidance on how to correctly configure the security settings in their 2009 to 2013 steps, but data compiled by the security firm Anapsis shows that 90% of affected SAP systems have not done that properly and protected themselves. Now, SAP's response is, well, always recommend to install security fixes as they are released and make sure you follow the security guide. Now, this is just another example of why organizations need to spend more time planning to move to the cloud. And as always, make sure they stay on top of their fixes. Well, that need to stay on top of the fixes doesn't stop with SAP. Here's a real shocker. There's less risk to open source code if you keep it up to date. You know, open source code is vital to software development in most organizations, but even though that's been true for a while, it doesn't mean that those companies have figured out how to use open source without inadvertently introducing vulnerabilities. A new study by the Synopsys Black Duck Audit Services team found that open source software vulnerabilities have decreased, but many organizations seem to be, have trouble keeping track of the patched status of their open source components. The team anonymized data for more than 1,200 code bases and enterprises in 17 different industries and found that more than 96% of those code bases contain open source software or libraries. And 60% of the code bases they audited had at least one vulnerability. The only good news, that's down from 78% with vulnerabilities in last year's study. Now, within those code bases, there's an average of 298 separate open source components, up from an average of 257 in the previous research. Open source component use is so prevalent that in 13 of the 17 industry sectors tracked, there were more open source than proprietary components in the code base. In most of these, unpatched code remains a significant problem. The report gave an example of the oldest vulnerability seen by researchers in this year's study, which dated from 1990. According to the report, 43% of the scanned code bases contained vulnerabilities more than 10 years old. Researchers are adamant that being aware of the code in a code base is critical for maintaining the updates and patches required for secure code. After all, as they say, you can't patch something you don't know you have. Well, we are less than a week from DockerCon, and Docker and Arm just announced a new partnership that will bring increased support for developers building container applications for Arm hardware. According to Docker, Arm integration is already available in the company's freely downloadable Docker desktop editions and will be included soon in its commercial offerings, most likely with the release of Docker Enterprise's next version. I, for one, am thrilled since Docker containers are something I'm exploring for helping to secure my IoT projects in the field, not the least of which containers alone will force more standardization of my IoT devices and promise some interesting benefits for doing secure boot of IoT devices and hopefully being able to check the hash of the containers before I allow them to start up. Now, Huawei has found its way into the news quite a bit lately. Now, none of it's been good for business and none of it's increased the customer trust. Well, there have been some allegations that it's flooded sanctions on Iran, attempted to steal trade secrets to enable Chinese spying through the telecom networks. 
built across the West and many more. While this latest news isn't going to help that much, Vodafone Group has acknowledged that it found vulnerabilities going back years with equipment supplied by Huawei for their carrier's Italian business. Now, Europe's biggest phone company identified hidden back doors in the software that could have given Huawei unauthorized access to the carrier's fixed line network in Italy, a system that provides internet service to millions of homes and businesses. Now, Vodafone asked Huawei to remove back doors in internet and home internet routers back in 2011 and received assurances from them that the issues were fixed. But further testing by Vodafone revealed that the security vulnerabilities remained. Now, Vodafone also identified back doors in parts of the fixed access network network known as optical service nodes, which are responsible for transporting internet traffic across optical fibers and other parts called broadband network gateways, which handle subscriber authentication and access to the internet. Now, this means that the Huawei actually might have a backdoor to access customers' personal computer and home network. Now, the interesting part here is the outcome of the reports. Vodafone is still okay with Huawei and opposes any blocks on Huawei technology, especially in the new 5G movement. Now, although backdoors are common in home routers, they're usually fixed by manufacturers once disclosed. This will either enlighten Huawei's business practices and allow them to pivot, or the market might decide it's time to move to another manufacturer. Even though the backdoors are an industry-wide challenge for Huawei, they might just be the juggernaut for their business, too. So where should you concentrate your anti-phishing efforts? Survey says... Facebook, and Instagram. According to the VOD Security Fisher's favorite report for the first quarter of 2019, social media saw more growth than any other phishing category as Facebook phishing spiked 155.5% and Instagram phishing URLs jumped, get ready for it, 1,868%. This pushed social media into fourth place in the most popular phishing category competition. In both cases, phishing on the platforms has dramatically decreased in the previous three quarters, and so far, researchers haven't been able to pinpoint a reason for their new popularity. Public clouds were the top category of phishing targets as more than 40% of phishing links impersonated cloud services. Now, as for brands, Microsoft was the top spoofed brand in the first quarter of 2019, Researchers attribute the trend to the high value of Office 365 credentials, which give intruders access to the Office 360 platform and let them commit a whole wide range of attacks. Now, you know, I never thought I'd be saying hurrah to find out that there are some hardware out there, especially medical hardware, that have vul vulnerabilities. But... A particular security flaw has made a friend's project viable. So anyway, let's read this. The gist is the old version of the Medtronic insulin pump has a vulnerability that allowed my buddies at OpenAPS to close the feedback loop on his then girlfriend, now, now his wife, insulin pump, and use a Raspberry Pi and her continuous glucose meter to build a system that continuously adjusts her insulin levels on demand according to her real blood glucose levels. This life-saving hack sadly only works on the Medtronic Minimed with version 2.4a firmware or lower. Sadly, at this moment, there are almost no other options that support closed-loop insulin dosing systems, and while the FDA isn't standing in the way of the open APS project, it isn't doing any support either. Kudos to the Europeans who have approved such devices like the AccuCheck with Android APS that is approved, but only outside the USA. Boo! Anyway, patients that would like to see this change are encouraged to contact their product manufacturers and perhaps also considering writing to the FDA in support of open APS and other closed-loop insulin dosing projects, perhaps starting their reading with the Tidepool.org project, which is actually seeking FDA approval for this concept in the USA. You know, I never thought I'd be rooting for a device with a security flaw. 
Now, the industry continues to surprise us with new technology, especially around bots and AI. Well, imagine if there were robots the size of a speck of dust. Now, thousands could fit side by side on a single silicon wafer similar to those used for computer chips, but then pull themselves free and start crawling. Sound interesting or scary? I'll let you be the judge there. Now, Dr. Mark Miskins, a.k.a. Dr. Frankenstein, is a professor of electrical and, and, and electrical and systems engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, and he thinks it might be time to rid yourself of the fear. His new robots take advantage of the same basic technology as computer chips. Many decades, teams have talked about smart dust, minuscule sensors that can report on conditions in the environment. But in developing practical versions, the smart dust became more became larger, more like smart gravel in order to fit inside batteries. Well, actually to fit in batteries. Now, Dr. Miskin worked around the power conundrum by leaving out the batteries and instead... He powers the robots by shining lasers on tiny solar panels on their backs. I don't know about you, but laser-powered dust bots. I smell a new sci-fi film coming along to scare us about the not-too-near not future. But if nothing else, this is a reality, which means bots are not just for cleaning your carpets anymore. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And that's Envoy Visitors. Now, when guests visit your business, your kiosks or booth or even your events, there always are first impressions, right? Well, you want to make it easy for visitors to arrive and check in. And Envoy Visitors changes the game here. Now, your organization will be ready for everything that comes through the front door. Welcome to the modern lobby. Now, Envoy Visitors is an iPad kiosk that makes workplaces a lot more efficient. How does it work? Well, well, when visitors arrive, they sign in on an iPad kiosk. They enter their details and sign any legal documents like NDAs right there on an iPad. They actually notify the host and it automatically alerts people when a guest arrives, saving you time and hassle. Now, your employees know who's coming and when, and it makes for those awkward meetings a thing of the past. Now, having a customer partner meetings all the time, I can tell you that having a system like Envoy Visitors streamlines the process for you and your visitor. Walk up, sign in, make a super easy experience. Now boost your office efficiency with smart security that doesn't intimidate. There's no more paper logbooks that doesn't provide any real value. You sign in unlimited visitors, print customized badges, send alerts, and alert when VIPs arrive. It even notifies administrators about unattended guests. You can integrate with your existing security systems like Wi-Fi access, ID checks and emergency notification systems, which all add to your security perimeter and strength. Plus, you'll have data on all of your visitors in your office so you know who's coming, when they're on site, and who they're meeting and why. Envoy Visitors works with tools you already use, like Active Directory, Slack, Okta, OneDrive, Skype for Business Box, Salesforce Chatter, and more. If you have your favorite pre-existing system, check out Envoy.com slash Twit to see if they have integration for you. Plus, they have a great API for the ones that you don't. Now, they're designed to help co companies of all types, including those in highly regulated industries, meet security and compliance requirements as well. Join companies like Nike, Pinterest, Spotify that have worked with Envoy to welcome over 30 million visitors to their organizations. Protect people, property, and ideas that, that welcoming way with Envoy. See why 10,000 workplaces worldwide choose Envoy to make a great first impression. Go to Envoy.com slash twit and start your free trial today. That's Envoy.com slash twit. And we thank Envoy for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. And this one's fairly interesting. You, many of you may have heard of the ambitious project driven by Elon Musk's SpaceX called Starlink. Now it targets to provide high-speed, low-latency low broadband around the world. Well, to achieve such ambitious goals, SpaceX will need to go on a campaign to create a large constellation of satellites to service such a wide surface area. You're going to have to send a bunch up. Now, unfortunately, this type of ambition would, requires actually has a bunch of roadblocks too. Now, originally SpaceX went to at the FTC for approval of launching over 4,425 satellites, the low orbit satellites, between an altitude of 
1,110 kilometers to 1,325 kilometers. But in order to reduce the number of satellites needed and ensure connectivity goals, SpaceX will need to reduce the orbital altitude of the satellites to a much lower orbit. Now, the question being, will this have an effect on the safety of the satellites as well? Well, SpaceX believes that, and I quote, given the atmospheric drag at this lower altitude, this relocation will significantly enhance space safety by ensuring that the, any, orbitable de, any orbitable debris will quickly reenter and demise in the atmosphere. Now, this may be the positive, but there are actually some drawbacks as well. As well. Being at that low orbit means that they have to work harder and expend more resources to stay in orbit. Now, SpaceX thinks they've tested enough and have solutions to fix this as well. I want to throw, the, throw it to you guys, to my co-host here. Now, to me, um, I want to throw it to you first, Curtis. Now, it sounds like SpaceX could just be adding just more orbital debris. Um, is this, is, is this like, for instance, Amazon is actually planning 3,000 of their own low orbit space, space, space satellites here. Now, are we just adding to that? Are we just adding to the orbital debris? Or is this, is this going to be a chance for for internet around the world and we're not going to have an issue with orbital problems? Um, I, I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, sure. <laughs> because on the one hand, this does add to the number of objects up there in orbit. On the other hand, the question really is not just objects in orbit, but at wh which altitude they're in orbit. Um, we have all kinds of different uh, if you want to think of them as bands or layers uh, of orbiting material, uh, some of those are pretty crowded bands. Uh, the uh, altitudes at which objects become uh, geostationary, for example, um, can be can be somewhat crowded. Um, the the SpaceX reapplication shows that they are looking at an altitude that is considerably below where most uh, critical both scientific and communication satellites live. And that's a good thing. My real question about these is, is twofold. First, if they're going to come down every five years, what's that going to do to the cost? I mean, if you've got to relaunch these satellites every five years, it's got to up the infrastructure cost. Although if you own the rockets, that probably helps. The other thing uh, is around this idea that they're designed to burn up completely on re-entry. Uh, that's wonderful. That's safe. Um, I also want to see it because it doesn't take a huge chunk of something uh, descending upon the earth from 550 kilometers um, to to seriously ruin your day if it, if it lands in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, Chief, I want to throw this to you. Now, how does now by lowering the orbit, how does this change the technology for them? Well, uh, low Earth orbit. Well, when you start talking about that kind of orbits, it has to move faster. So, the University of Hawaii actually has CubeSats, well, microsats that we launch, and the cool thing is they're launched at very low altitudes, but they move like a son of a son of a gun. So. You, when you actually see our antennas, which are actually almost directly above my head, uh, tracking, it's kind of going like nice and fast. Um, so you don't you have smaller windows to download data from them. So Kurt and I actually did a test many, many, many years ago with, when we were both working for InfoWorld on a device called a digital fountain. And um, so what SpaceX and other people are going to start having to do when they start talking about devices that small moving that fast, they're going to have to get a lot more creative on how they do communications. So very, very quickly, digital fountains are kind of like RAID. You have all these different slices. They purposely slice up your data and add a whole bunch of error correction codes to each channel. Then if the data comm link is uh, reliable, it will purposely drop out channels and mathematically recreate them at the far end. So that way you can move more data quicker in the same arc angle um, when you're having a nice fast satellite. So yeah, these things are going to be moving. They're going to have to have different types of technology. Um, personally, I think they're going to have to get away from traditional batteries because um, you don't want to have lithium-ion batteries in there. They're probably going to be going to small 
hydrogen-based fuel cells so that when they burn up, they burn up completely. Um, there's actually some research on paper hydrogen fuel cells, which are kind of an interesting technology. So, yeah. So to directly answer your question, there are going to have to be a lot of technology changes to be able to play at that kind of altitude. And the good news is a lot of it's already been solved by the folks that are launching CubeSats. Now, I think Curtis brought up an interesting question before. He said, hey, this is a fairly highly populated portion of altitude. Uh, for instance, the Air Force is in that area with their satellites, the Iridium Network, uh, Dove satellites, um, the, Indian, in, the Indian government's testing a bunch of AS, uh, ASAT tests in that kind of area. Curtis, do you think that this is the low orbit satellites are just the new plastics of space? Are we doing too much dumping here? Well, there, there is some, some crowding going on, and it's complicated by things like the, um, the Indian government's recent anti-satellite test, which successfully blew up a satellite, oh, by the way, sprinkling space debris throughout uh, an orbital ring. Um, the thing is, in general, the various nations who are spacefaring nations, the nations who are putting up, nations and companies that are putting up uh, satellites, uh, coordinate. They know where the satellites are supposed to be. Um, the problem comes in things that aren't satellites. If you have uh, a malfunction that blows a satellite apart, uh, if you have pieces and parts that come off of rockets boosting a satellite to a higher orbit, uh, things that aren't planned, those are the real issues. The things we know about, the things that are intentional, uh, the things that are behaving properly, those can be planned for, those can be worked around, kind of like the air traffic control around airports. It's um, the random drones of the orbital rings um, that cause real problems and which I suspect we're going to have to be worried about uh, more and more as time goes on. Got it, got it. Well, Chris, I want to get to your bite because there is a conundrum with IT and security, right? There is indeed. And it's not so much technological, it's cultural. You see... According to recent studies, security, cybersecurity, doesn't trust IT, and IT doesn't trust cybersecurity. Put them together, and it's a real problem. That's because IT operations and security teams share the bulk of responsibility for protecting organizations from digital threats. And lack of trust and cooperation between the two can compromise security. As part of the Getting Your House in Order report commissioned by 1E, uh, analysts from Vanson Born polled 600 senior IT decision makers, th half from IT operations and half from IT security. They wanted to find out what the challenges were, and they found that this crisis of trust is one of the biggest challenges they face. <clears throat> now, 60% of the respondents said that they had suffered a serious security breach in the last 18, uh, 24 months. 30% have experienced more than one. Leading causes of breaches are lack of clear security protocols and unpatched software. Each of those were involved in more than half, followed by a lack of collaboration between IT operations and security and lack of patch automation. Now, less than one quarter of the people responding to this survey said that they think IT operations and security teams work well together to secure the organization. Experts point to things like poor cohesion, disparity in objectives, because IT ops will typically push forward with projects which then get slowed down by the concerns of IT security. So questions like who owns cha the change management process become critical. In most organizations, change management is owned by operations. But the data shows that the lack of trust between operations and IT, whose job it is, I'm, I'm sorry, security, 
whose job it is to point out problems causes friction. About half of security pros say they can rely on IT to cover security alerts, but only 48% feel that they can cover, uh, depend on IT to cover data breaches and keep software up to date. The problem is that this rocky relationship affects the perception that each of these groups has of the other and the willingness each group has to work with the other. About three quarters of respondents think IT has a keep the lights on attitude that prioritizes availability over security. Well, that's because they apparently don't understand that security, if it's breached, can have a huge impact on availability. IT operations team say that the work that security does makes securing the organization more complicated. And as we all know, security is the enemy, our, our complication is the enemy of both security and dependability. So better practices, better reporting practices, better performance management, all could help drive funding, awareness, and efficacy for security. So the question that I'm going to turn to my co-hosts is, to begin with, why is it so darn difficult to bridge the gap between these two groups? Brian, you've worked on both sides of this. Let, let me go to you with this question first. Actually, um, I don't, you know, there's been a lot, there's been all kinds of finger pointing, name calling, you name it. Um, I think a lot of it really boils down to expectations not being recorded. My suggestion is, and um, maybe I'm going to try and have to eat my own dog food here, is try and create the equivalent of, say, maybe a SLA between operations and security. Because realistically, there has to be a middle ground. Uh, otherwise, it's you know anti-business or anti-organizational. Um, both sides have very valid um, opinions, um, but there needs to be a set of expectations. There needs to be let's let's call it marching orders. Um, I my personal opinion about most civilian organizations that I've worked for is that without a doubt, almost all of them lack a clear chain of command. So that starts yielding finger pointing. Now, the advantage of working in a military organization is you have little insignias on people's shoulders and you point to those and say, okay, you're the boss. You're clearly the boss. You're in the chain of command. You make you tell us what to do. Um, that has some severe, the big advantages uh, when you start a finger pointing match. So maybe the civilian sector needs to go and learn something from the military. Well, Lou, I, I was going to turn to you with a, a question based off of that because you obviously have worked for and continue to work for some fairly large organizations. The security group and the IT operations group frequently report up in entirely different management structures, one to the CIO, the other to the CISO. To what extent do you think this dual reporting tree, this dual management uh, structure, contributes to the problem that we're talking about? <laughs> That's a good question. I think I think you got to remember, like organizations, you know, there's there's a bunch of bureaucratic processes and 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 things that go along with them. I you know I've been in organizations where support IT and operations have all been different, and because of that, it creates. Um, you know, granted, they have to all work together. And so, um, you know, things kind of their systems kind of in between them to ensure that they're all alerted and kept up to, to speed. And that sometimes works. But when you try to enforce or push down a process to one or the other, it creates a problem because a lot of you all as a different part of the organization, you uh, you have different uh, quotas, and you have different um, objectives. And so that creates a problem. But I have been in organizations where they've kind of aligned that as well. And they put it all in the same structure and the pro sometimes there's a problem with that as well and the reason is 
because uh, you know they tend to uh, sometimes look over or overlook processes because of that. Um, and so, you know, even though they've been mandated from the top down to do specific things, they don't, they're not always given the amount of funds or the amount of resources they need to, to actually do the thing right. So there's always problems. I don't think that changing reporting structure is going to be it. I think it's more of an alignment between the objectives and goals between both IT and security, as well as alignment of tools and alignment of processes, uh, will help with that. Um, but I don't think I don't think reporting structure is going to do it. You know, it's amazing just how many problems can be solved by the the simple sounding expedient of having everyone in an organization working toward the same kind of goal. Uh, it's the as I said, it's the sort of thing that sounds simple, but can be awfully difficult to pull off in practice. Well, speaking of working toward the same goal, I think all of us here at Twyet have the goal of getting to our guest as rapidly as possible. So toward that end, I'm going to pass things off to Lou once again. Lou, over to you. Fantastic. Well, before we get to our great guest, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Pulseway. Now, imagine being able to manage and control your entire environment, IT environment, from the palm of your hand. Sounds like a ploy, right? Well, imagine you can reset users' passwords from your phone or kill processes that are slowing down machines in critical paths while taking a stroll in the park. Well, you don't need to imagine anymore. Pulseway lets you monitor, manage, and control all your Windows, Linux, and Mac systems from anywhere using any device, including your smartphone. Now, Pulseway is a leading provider of mobile-first, cloud-first remote monitoring and management software, and you can monitor and manage everything. Now, see real-time status, system resources and logged-in users, view network performance, Windows updates, IIS, SQL Server, Exchange, Active Directory, monitor VMware, uh, Hyper-V, SMP-enabled devices, and many more. Always be in control. You can react to issues right away, fix issues on the go. You can even run commands in terminals, manage running processes, restart services, apply critical updates, and restart systems and more. I can go on and on and on. They handle all the OS and app intricacies. No need to further figure out yourself. They actually provide PowerShell scripts to collect all the data for you, and the system kind of unifies and aggregates it all together. Especially, they automate everything by creating and deploying custom scripts to actually automate all your IT tasks, saving time and increasing your overall efficiency. Now, you can automate anything from backup jobs to security checks on schedule or on demand at any time from any device closest to you. Now, with patch management, you can scan, install, and update all of your systems on the go. You can even do it on demand or schedule it and execute it at a particular date. Now, quickly and with little effort, connect to a computer as if you're sitting right in front of it without opening any ports or creating any firewall rules with the remote desktop control. It switches between screens, sends key strokes, and controls the mouse without having to travel to your machine. Now, if you're ready to take control of your organization's assets without being confined to your desk or your machine, it's time to take a look at Pulseway. Now, visit Pulseway.com slash twit and learn how thousands of organizations and system admins are making their IT environment more efficient and secure. Try it free for 14 days at Pulseway.com slash twit. And we thank Pulseway for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show and the co-host's favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. Today, we have Karan Bata, Director of Product Management HP for HPC for Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Karan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Now, our audience really loves to hear origin stories. Can you kind of take us through your journey in technology and in industry and what brought you to Oracle Cloud Infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. So I've, uh, you know, I run some, uh, a couple of teams here, uh, HPC being one of them, um, been here for about two years, uh, two years and a bit. And in fact, it's quite interesting because, you know, Oracle uh, kind of jumped into the cloud business in the last 18 to 24 months. So I've sort of seen the start of things and, uh, you know, where we are today. Prior to this, actually, I was part of the uh, Microsoft Azure uh, compute team. And so I spent uh, several years uh, at Azure, um, uh, you know, working with the amazing team at Microsoft 
Um, and then prior to that, um, I was actually part of a small startup um, uh, out of New Zealand that was acquired by Microsoft uh, called Green Button. Uh, we were uh, sort of born out of the Lord of the Rings trilogies, uh, which was which is an interesting story in itself. Uh, so uh, my entire career has been essentially uh, in high performance computing, distributed in parallel computing, um, mostly in, in cloud computing, and even before then when um, uh, cloud computing was really grid computing uh, in, in some some extent. So uh, that's that's my journey. And then, you know, obviously the the, the lure of uh, creating something from brand new, you know, there's only a couple of companies in the world really at this point um, that can sort of muscle their way into a cloud, uh, you know, cloud industry. And that's, you know, that's Oracle and that's why I'm here. Fantastic. Now, to kind of jump into HPC high performance computing. It, you know, it's kind of broken up into different parts. Like you have high performance technical computing, business computing. There's all these different facets to the market. Can you kind of just give us a lay of the land here and what, what it means by HPC? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you know, I think the the definition for HPC is really sort of far and beyond what it used to be, right? Uh, you should, you know, you used to say HPC, and you know, people you know suddenly think R and D or scientific computing, or you know, folks at universities doing lots of uh, you know running lots of different open source applications like NAMD or Gromax or something like that. Now it's sort of much broader than that. Now it's you know things like rendering in the media space, where you need thousands and thousands of cores to be able to you know do an animation job as an example or it's you know car big big car manufacturers running uh, crash analysis or crash simulations or uh, you know running CAE and CFD uh, type workloads um, uh, you know all the way to DNA sequencing so so it's it's really a big big portfolio of different use cases and it's sort of really uh, you know is, is more it's turning into big compute as opposed to just technical computing uh, and that's really what high performance computing is you know because at the end of the day um, you know our customers uh, that want HPC performance uh, really are looking for large pal- parallel computing resources to be able to run their workloads on mission critical or otherwise. So there's been a lot of talk. I think I've talked to a lot of um, industry people that talk about, hey, it's the fourth industrial revolution. People are focusing more on AI. How has maybe AI and machine learning kind of propelled high performance computing forward? Yeah, in fact, I think I think AI really has sort of uh, you know jump started the, the the transition for traditional HPC into into the cloud. Um, you know the way we the, the way I look at it, there's really two sets of audiences here. Uh, there's you know the sort of the traditional uh, uh, high performance computing applications and things that were built you know 30, 40 years ago to build cars and big oil rigs and things like that. And, and those workloads are traditionally still on premise right now, and they're very big, you know, very monolithic. They're, they're supporting mission, mission critical business applications or business goals, uh, and those haven't really transitioned to the cloud yet. And then there's sort of the cloud native side of things, which is things like AI and ML, where you know lots of lots of applications are open source. You know, you look at the success of TensorFlow as an example. Uh, lots of developer uh, developer focus there, and very cloud friendly in the sense that. You know, lots of these applications have been developed in the cloud and have matured in the cloud. Uh, and, uh, you know, lots of these uh, applications sort of fall into the R&D space where, uh, you know, people are still trying to figure out some of the use cases for AI and ML. And so the cloud native side has really sort of propelled some of the use and migration of the, of the on-prem workloads and in, into the cloud. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that's, that's been very, very helpful Makes sense. I think that we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit more because you bring up a good point about on-premise. And I think when I bring my co-host back in, Brian can even talk about a little bit about how they've actually applied HPC on their on-premise. But the interesting thing here is um, how is this affecting uh, the cloud native movement? Now, we, a lot of people are spending a lot of money still on on-premise, but a lot of them want to go to the cloud. Is there a shift because they need high performance computing? They're saying, hey, it's too expensive to do it on premise. Let's now just go and start paying for services. And is it pushing more people to the cloud because they need that kind of compute and horsepower behind them? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's different, definitely different facets here, right? I think I think traditionally most HPC workloads haven't moved to the cloud, you know, primarily because of performance or price. But I think now most of these, uh, you know, workloads are compelled to move to the cloud because you have lots of, you know, it allows sort of the the you know the cloud allows the little guy to really compete with the big dog, big dog, right? In some sense, where you know if you're a big car manufacturer and you're running things the way you already have been with, you know, large data center footprints on 
on-premise and you know you're you're having to manage uh, you know lots of hardware that's not your co-competency but you have to do it and then you have to recycle and you have to refresh that hardware so it's a lot of lot of uplift but then you've got the small startups which are doing maybe the same thing and they can go straight to the cloud so a lot of their capex has turned into opex and they're spending more of their time on their business value right so Essentially, it allows a small guy to compete with the big guy because of the because of the ability of the cloud. And traditionally, cloud providers haven't really provided the right level of infrastructure to compete in the HPC space because it's very specialized. It requires, you know, uh, specific networking stacks. As an example, it's you know, you, you require much much higher level degree of uh, performance from a from a predictability stand, standpoint. Um, so there's lots of different facets to it, and, and you know, I think I think that movement has really been. Uh, 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 the the ability for the small guy to compete with the big guy has been the big compelling uh, compelling portion of it. Now we'll, we'll get off the market in a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about the market before we get to technology. But there has been a shift. Obviously, big data is pushing a lot of organizations to do particular things. Is there a difference between or a breakdown difference between like storage kind of storage HPC versus compute? Are they in tandem? Uh, organizations kind of following with both. Um, or do you see kind of a, hey, more people want compute, uh, and so that's kind of the trend right now versus big data, that kind of thing? Uh, it's a bit of both. Uh, it's definitely a bit of both. I think I think uh, one of one or the other can't work without the other, so or if, if that makes sense. So, you know, you can't have lots of compute and then, you know, not a good story on the storage side because, you know, uh, for example, in oil and gas workloads, you may need, uh, you know, lots of throughput, lots of IOPS uh, to be able to, to do the work. But then in automotive, as an example, you may need, you know, much better local uh, uh, scratch performance on the node itself that's doing the computation. So it's, you know, compute and storage are definitely hand in hand, which is why I, you know, say it's not really, uh, you know, high performance computing more. So it's just big compute so lots and lots of cores lots and lots of data um, you know whether it's scratch or, or otherwise uh, so I think they're they're definitely intertangled uh, and then the third big piece is really networking uh, you know if you have thousands and thousands of cores you're not fitting those thousand cores uh, you know or tens of thousands of cores in a single box you're actually working across a data center so you really need you know super fast networking super low latency to be able to achieve those uh, metrics. And there's tons and tons of applications and workloads and use cases and scenarios here, but what are I think I know Oracle Cloud Infrastructure was kind of built from the ground up to focus on HPC. Are there are there particular areas or use cases you're focused on, or is it just kind of a general application base? Yeah, uh, th- really good question. I think you know when we started, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, you know, with OCI um, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, the the intent was to be flexible and to support performance. So, you know, one of the core components and the core pillars of our cloud is bare metal, uh, and and what I mean by that is true bare metal, where there's no Oracle software running on the node. Uh, you know, just like on other cloud providers, when you spin off an instance, you could do the same thing on OCI. The only difference is that it's a bare metal node. Um, you can even go into things like BIOS settings and things. You know, uh, so we we have this is our secret sauce essentially, right? Um, now, bare metal allows us to do a couple of things. Obviously, performance is a huge, huge beneficiary uh, in terms of HPC, but it allows us to do things like, hey, if you have a virtualized environment, feel free to bring it on top. But from an HPC perspective, it gives us really native performance, uh, you know, compared to on-premise, uh, because most of you know HPC workloads still run on-premise, so we're we're essentially really, you know, positioning ourselves against uh, on-premise hardware. And then, uh, you know, the second portion of that is really the networking piece where, uh, you know, we have a flat network. Um, and then the use cases that we're really targeting for are big manufacturing use cases, big genomics use cases, big uh, media entertainment use cases where the characteristics are very similar. Um, yeah, applications may be different. But the performance characteristics and the needs are very, very, very much similar, and we're essentially using our heritage from, you know, database applications, right? I mean, Oracle uh, has a long uh, and 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 very, very fruitful history in databases. Um, you know, we we have Exadata as an example, which is using similar type of tech, and we're essentially using that history to to sort of benefit our our cloud applications in the future. Um, and so, you know, some applicant, you know, as an example, uh, somebody may want to run CFD applications, and 
then to run CFD, you need MPI support. And for MPI support, you know, we need to have uh, an RDMA-based networking stack, which we have, right? So those are some of the use cases that we're, we're targeting against very historical legacy applications um, uh, that haven't been able to move to the cloud today, but now they do have an option to move to OCI uh, with, with very, very special targeted um, hardware and, and solution. Now, there are some disruptive technologies that are kind of changing HPC a little bit. Uh, we've heard a little bit about ARM, a lot about GPU. How are, how are these technologies changing it and how is kind of Oracle handling that? Yeah, so I mean, I think I think that's that's an interesting question. I think we've seen more of a uh, more of a push towards GPU and acceleration uh, as opposed to uh, on the ARM side. Uh, the 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 reason for that is the programming model, right? So these applications run by some of the largest companies on the planet. You know, think the Dassault's of the world or the Ansys or big companies like Altair that design uh, you know CFD applications or software for big manufacturing. You know, if you want to design a nut and a bolt for a for a plane part, as an example, and these things are very very. Uh, heavy uh you know compute heavy and data intensive applications so you know they've they've looked towards more acceleration hardware acceleration as a way to benefit uh the 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 sort of the innovation of technology so you know lots of these applications are now CUDA aware so that you can run them on gpus but you can also run them on cpus if you want to or x86 hardware so i think we've seen a lot of transition towards uh gpus uh you know from an acceleration standpoint where you know if you deploy a thousand cores that's equivalent to deploying let's say you know two 16-way gpu machines um with cuda uh, as 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 your programming uh language and uh you know acceleration of anywhere from five to ten x on certain workloads so it definitely makes a lot of sense i think there's still a long way to go in terms of adoption because obviously the hardware is very different the methodologies of deploying gpus is very different and then with the the innovation rate of how nvidia is improving their hardware every year makes the cloud even 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 of a better motivator uh, for these customers to, to test this stuff out in the in the cloud makes sense now going back to i think you brought up a little bit about networking before and obviously Having HPC, especially clusters, and having high-speed interconnects between these two, these two things, low latency, um, how is kind of Oracle or OCI kind of helping with this? I know I've heard a little bit about remote direct memory access. Is this something new? Is this something that's going to help? How is this working? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we knew from beforehand, right, we started with building blocks. So, you know, RDMA is the end goal uh, for a lot of these legacy applications where you have tightly coupled workloads where the, the you know, the thousands of machines or thousands of cores need to work very well together in conjunction. So, you know, if you have a job that runs across, you know, 100 nodes and one of the node fails, because it's a tightly coupled uh, application, the entire job will fail. So you really need to have low latency and very predictable uh, performance from a network and compute standpoint. So, you know, we knew we wanted to get there eventually, but we started with uh, making sure that our network topology throughout our data centers, in fact, is, is very well architected to this end goal. So what that meant was when we came out with our initial offering, um, you know, in OCI, we made sure that we don't oversubscribe. That's one of the largest I guess I would say differentiators uh, is the fact that we don't oversubscribe our network. So most of our bare metal boxes that we allow customers to launch on demand, uh, you know, you can get two by 25 gig next. So that means you can have two single line rates of 25 gig uh, going across from one uh, bare metal instance to any other bare metal instance in our data center or across regions. Uh, so th that that is a huge, huge a differentiator just from a bandwidth perspective. You're getting 50 gig aggregate from any one machine to any other machine. So that helps. Uh, and because we have a very flat Klaus network, which is you know not a, not a new concept, uh, but from a cloud perspective, it's it's very different. Um, so uh, you know that reduces the latency within our data center. So you know while other other clouds are very. Uh, uh, sort of supportive of some of the commercial workloads, we took a different route and we said, we're going to have non-oversubscribe flat network that gives us latencies in the in the millisecond range, whereas, uh, you know, sorry, microsecond range, whereas some of the other cloud providers maybe in the millisecond range. Uh, and then from there, we built on top of that and said, okay, well, what if we replaced our NICs with RDMA-enabled NICs? Great. Now we have, you know, from 50 gig, now we have a 100 gig neck from any one instance to any other instance. And because it's a non, 
non-oversubscribed and flat network, we also get super low latencies in the microsecond range, single digit microsecond, in fact, where you know uh, we have anywhere, anywhere from one node to any other node, we can get two microsecond latency, which is pretty much on-prem performance. Fantastic. Well, I, I do want to have one pivot question here because I want to get to my co-host. They, they're much more experienced in HPC than I am, so they have some great, great questions waiting. But one question is, from my perspective, I'm big on open source. How has maybe open source adoption impacted the HPC and the adoption of HPC? Um, I think I think uh, it's obviously been, uh, you know, quite well adopted in uh, the AI and ML space, right? Um, you know, I think from a from a traditional HPC standpoint, I think on the research side, it's definitely been historically uh, open source, you know, with applications like NAMD or Gromax uh, being kind of the majority of that. Um, uh, lots of uh, open source scheduling software has been successful in some of these workloads uh, from, a, again, from a legacy HPC standpoint where, you know, lots of customers and lots of, uh, you know, organizations are using things like Slurm or Torque for management of their clusters, right? Which is very much agnostic to where you're running the cluster itself. Uh, but the actual applications have been, you know, very commercial, right? Where these applications cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars per seat because they're essentially being used to build cars or planes or, or whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, on the AI and ML side, most of the frameworks, you know, you can think about TensorFlow as, as, as a perfect example and then all of the other, uh, you know, portfolio of ML and AI uh, frameworks like Torque or PyTorch or uh, Chainer, PFN networks, uh, those are constantly being updated. And because there's been such breakthroughs almost on a weekly basis that it seems like somebody's breaking some record on some kind of a benchmark, these are the ones it's it's almost entirely open source. Uh, most of the ML AI, because a lot of this stuff is happening in dorm rooms and uh, you know research centers. Uh, and so I think on the AI ML side, it's mostly applications. On the sort of legacy HPC side, uh, most of the open source is uh, you know adoption on the schedulers and the resource management of the clusters. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in, starting with you, Brian, because you have some pretty good amount of experience with HPC, right? Yeah, actually, the University of Hawaii actually would love to have more HPC capability. Um, to that end, the university bought a Cray. Uh, however, the interesting uh, disruptive um, issue that's coming up is power and cooling. Um, running an on-prem cluster is getting a lot more expensive, and... Um, we need to start looking at other things that we can do, especially on the smaller research groups that uh, need to have a little bit tighter control over their um, their cluster runs. So the question I'm asking is, we're almost all MPI. And schedulers typically have um, multiple queues, high priority, low priority, and so forth, or run when it's available type of things. Uh, does OCI have such things so that the smaller guys can say get a lower cost run in in non priority time. Yeah, that, that's that's actually a very interesting topic. I think cost management has been one of the biggest topics I think in HPC because, you know, from a uh, from a from a workload perspective, right? You're you know, we're really working with two sets of uh, audiences, uh, you know, even within HPC, uh, you know, I talked about legacy and, and cloud native, but even within legacy, right, most of the MPI applications, we're working with the IT guys that are managing the infrastructure. And then there's the the actual, you know, data scientists or, you know, CFD engineers or, uh, you know, other engineers or designers that are actually running the jobs. And those guys just want the latest stuff and they want to run their stuff, you know, as quickly as possible. And then, you know, there's really a balance of power here where you know there may not be enough resources on prem we have a couple of different things that we're using that to to solve right uh Obviously, from an MPI standpoint, a lot of people are deploying things like InfiniBand, uh, you know, uh, networking infrastructures, or they're deploying things like, um, as you mentioned, Craze. These are very, very expensive, uh, you know, pieces of kit, um, right? And for our infrastructure, as an example, we deploy Ethernet. 
uh, it's cheap, it's manageable, it's extendable, it's uh, well known, and so we deployed Rocky V2 as part of that infrastructure, uh, you know, based on Ethernet. So uh, we still allow for RDMA using Rocky, uh, which is you know based on uh, uh, just Ethernet. So and we're hitting the same levels of performance as an infinite band cluster or Cray cluster on-prem. So that's that's one place where we're saving a huge amount of money from just a network infrastructure standpoint. And we give those savings to the customer where it may cost you, you know, anywhere from three to 10 cents of, you know, running a core on-prem, but then the same cost can be run on the cloud. Now, the other thing that you get out of the cloud from moving on-prem to the cloud is is the 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 hardware innovation cycle. So you may have a three-year-old piece of hardware that you're using today for MPI workloads, because MPI is very single-threaded. Uh, you know. Uh, performance-based, you may get better performance out of the new processors that we're deploying in the cloud because we're constantly updating our fleet, right? We're obviously constantly deploying new processors. We're deploying new new, new sets of hardware. Uh, we have to keep up. And so, you know, on-prem customers just getting the benefit out of cloud providers, you know, kept uh, continually updating that. And then finally, we have the governance model where, you know, you can set cost limits. So you can say things like, hey, person A with a account B is able to spend only $1,000. And then once that $1,000 is spent, then, you know, shut the cluster down. Uh, so, you know, we can do very, very interesting things like that. And then finally, you know, OCI, you know, we've, you know, a lot of our, uh, you know, employees here have worked on other cloud providers before and sort of understand the challenges around uh, first party services and things like schedulers that you talked about that have lots of priority queues and things. The approach we've taken is slightly different. Uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, if you go to some other cloud provider today, you may have to, uh, you know, again, it, it works well for them because they're established. Uh, you know, you may have to go in and you know, uh, integrate into their API, which is very specific to that cloud provider. We've taken the tact that, you know, we'll go and pick the winner out of the open source schedulers. So as an example, if you wanted to run Slurm, or let's say you wanted to manage your infrastructure by Terraform, a very simple example, you wanted to manage your uh, uh, instances or your resources on OCI using Terraform. Well, great, Terraform is a first-class citizen. So in fact, you could take your existing Terraform template from other cloud providers or even on-prem, and you could literally bring that over to OCI and we would recognize it as a first-class citizen. So we've taken the act of actually taking tools that people already use today and putting them in our cloud as as first first class citizens. So if you wanted to use Slurm, you could use Slurm. If you wanted to use Torque, you can use Torque. If you wanted to use PBS uh, Pro as a, as a resource management or job management tool, we support that as well. So our our intent is to allow people to use existing tools and 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 use those tools to be able to restrict or manage their clusters and then we have some platform level capabilities in terms of governance for cost management or quota management okay so one last question i'm being very selfish sorry i'm asking from an academic of course. standpoint well, almost all the major academic institutions are directly on the internet too is oci um, on the internet too, so we can get the lower latencies and higher bandwidths from our facilities on-prem and then migrate to OCI? Yes, OCI uh, is part of internet too, correct. Nice, thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, well we do want to throw it to Kurt, because Kurt, you have some questions about HPC and applications. Yeah, you know, for the longest time, uh, being an HPC programmer was defined by your knowledge of Cray vectorizing Fortran. And even though that is a, a smaller piece of the job requirement, um, being able to put together an application that really takes advantage of the massively parallel architecture of most HPC platforms um, is a learned art. It's, it's a skill. And so my question is, do you have ways um, that can help people who are, are developing, who want to use an HPC platform to develop and perhaps even do a basic test of their code before they move to, to the full um, higher dollar HPC platform? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, that, that's a really good example. I think, you know, one of the things that we always talk about is, uh, you know, People talk about lift and shift. Uh, we talk about move and improve. Uh, people talk about you know building cloud native applications. We you know our tagline is you know bring your past, build your future, um, and we really embody that in terms of you know let's say HPC as an example. This is where this is actually going back to the the older question uh, as well, which is, you know, we're what we're really trying to do is we're trying to take away uh, 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 we're trying to take away the tedious part of HPC, right? If you're if you're a student and you're learning the new ML you know framework, or if you're a student that or if you're an engineer that doesn't know about the cloud, but you're trying to build an application to benefit um, you know your CFD or CAE workload, we want you to focus on that, and then leave the hard stuff to us in terms of infrastructure. So, you know, absolutely. If you wanted to run a job, you could run a job on the biggest, baddest bare metal machine on OCI, but then you can also run that same job on a VM with one core. So you're absolutely able to do these things, you know, you know, on the on on the on the dime, essentially, right? You can you can you can run a workload for an hour and only pay like under a buck if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to test. And then you could use the same code to deploy a biggest, baddest bare metal machine that's going to cost you, you know, a couple of dollars more. And so, you know, I think we we support the full spectrum of, uh, uh, you know, deploying this this code. Um, you know, again, most of the universities or schools out there that are sort of like teaching HPC or distributed computing or parallel computing, or even in some of the universities now where data science is becoming very prevalent and, you know, they're teaching things like TensorFlow, you could come and actually use a portion of a GPU today, which is going to cost you only a couple of bucks, but then you can go and use something like a DGX on OCI, which is 16 GPUs, you know, super badass. It's like $20 an hour. You could use that too, rather than having to go spend $300,000 on a piece of you know machinery on prem. You could certainly be at the very end of one spectrum, test your code, do a lot of dev test, get get yourself to the point where you want to run these things in production, and then actually deploy the same code, uh, but just by using something else. So you can absolutely do the full spectrum. Well, one last question. Again, back to tradition. HPC uh, coding and applications have been their own thing. Uh, scientists and engineers ran the code, got the results, interpreted it, then passed it off to, to other groups. Are you beginning to see with, uh, with your platform people doing things like designing HPC um, applications into larger, more integrated cloud infrastructures where there is a portion of the application that will be run on the, the big GPU iron, then pass it off automatically to something else for analysis and presentation? Or do we still have this sort of hard segregation between tasks? I think I think it's a mixture. Uh, I think more and more ISVs are taking the the you know the the ball in their own court and actually building SaaS uh, type you know services or their applications as services onto onto the cloud. So as an example, uh, you know a couple of uh, last year actually we partnered with Altair, who are who are actually providing their core uh, uh, you know business value which is uh, they have two applications called nanofluid and um, uh, nanofluid X and ultrafluid X which uh, simulates the the, the 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 water and the actual liquid inside let's say a car's you know fuel tank and that actual code runs on OCI as a service so that it's fully integrated into your pipe pipeline so you know, a company that's, you know, doing this sort of work will never have to go on-prem or hand over results to some other group. Everything just stays in the cloud. The go-ahead, they design the actual model in the cloud using a GPU uh, node as like a graphics piece. They will design the model. They would then put it into this ultra-fluid X. They would run the simulation on HPC nodes. The data would get uploaded into object storage after the job is done. And then somebody else would access object storage to then go look at the results and to another GP node, which is running, let's say, you know, Citrix's HDX 3D Pro. So the entire workflow actually runs in the cloud. It's distributed. It allows lots of collaboration for, you know, for teams that are globally distributed. But then there are still customers today that have physical needs uh, where they would run the actual simulation and then as part of their 
as part of their delivery mechanism, they actually need to take back the data on prem and actually deploy it onto physical uh, physical infrastructure. Maybe it's a car, maybe it's maybe it's machinery or a lift or uh, or robotics, as an example, or hand it over to uh, uh, to their clients for deployment and field. So there, there there's a bit of a mixture, and I think the trend is definitely headed towards entire HPC pipelines or entire big compute pipelines moving to the cloud, uh, and you know dissipating the need for having anything essentially you know, on-prem. Well, Karan, we're, we're running low on time. Thank you so much for being here. But I do want to give you a chance to uh, maybe talk to us about where organizations can go, learn a little bit more about Oracle Cloud Infrastructure or HPC, where they can get started, uh, who do they need to contact, where do they need to go? Absolutely, yeah. In fact, if you go to cloud.oracle.com, uh, you know you can find uh, you know uh, a way to sign up uh, for free. You can get some free credits that allows you to actually get you know a bunch you know uh, enough money to be able to spin up a cluster. And as, as an example, so you get enough money to even even run GPUs, which are very expensive. Um, you know, so I would I would encourage everybody to go try it out. You know, we always say that you know us talking about these things is one, but you actually going and trying this out for yourself is another. Other, right. I think we always kind of uh, our motto is go try it out. Tell us we're wrong. Right. Uh, we love to collaborate. I think that there's there's folks that want to do something interesting uh, in the HPC space. We would love to talk to them. Uh, you can you can contact us uh, through the uh, through the online portal uh, once you sign up, uh, and uh, you know uh, you can also contact me on Twitter if you like. Fantastic. We love those free credits. We love them. We love them. Well, folks, <laughs> we've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the Best Day Enterprise podcast, according to 9 out of 10 HPC Workload Bits. But I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host in crime, starting with our geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, where can the folks at home find you and all of your fantastic work? I'm... A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab on Twitter, or I'm Chebert at twit.tv. Better yet, why don't you send it to twiet at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, we'd love to hear your suggestions. We A lot of these shows are driven by user requests, and um, I'll tell you, this was a great show. I, you know, Thank you very much, Karan. I'm I actually work with the uh, smart meter guys. We're actually modeling the entire University of Hawaii system uh, so we can more intelligently integrate um, sustainable energy because we have to be net zero by 2045. And if we don't have people running HPC clusters in their offices or their departmental data centers, that's a less an expensive energy because Hawaii has some of the most expensive electricity in the union. <laughs> well, we'd love to work with you, Brian. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks again, Karan. Thanks again, Brian. Well, of course, we have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, where can the folks at home find you and all of your work? Well, people can always find my writing over at darkreading.com. Uh, we've got uh, some... Good interop content that's still going to be flowing out. Uh, I'll be heading out there in uh, about three weeks. And uh, believe it or not, the year is flying by. So we've just had the first Black Hat briefings released. So we'll be starting uh, Black Hat preview information uh, real soon now. Uh, I'm still going to be traveling around. This coming week, I'm actually going to be off from dark reading, going to be working on some uh, personal projects. So you can uh, keep up with those sorts of things, plus everything I write on Twitter at KG4GWA and on Instagram, Kurt Franklin, you'll find me and uh, would love to hear from you via direct message either place or hit me up on the email there, editor, uh, twiet at twit.tv. Thanks so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure being part of the Twiet Riot. Thanks, Kurt. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You are our loyal listener and viewer. You drop in each and every week to watch and listen to your enterprise news and get your enterprise goodness for the week. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen onto the show. So go right now to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of the amazing back episodes that we've had, plus all of the show notes, co-host information, our guest information, 
plus all the links to all the show, all the stories that we did during the show. Plus, more importantly, next to those videos, you have those really helpful download and subscribe links. Those are very important. Support the show by getting your audio version, video version, and your H2 video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices. It's really the best way to, to get your enterprise and IT goodness for the week. So go ahead and check that out as well as after you subscribe, go ahead and share us with your favorite friend, your friend, your family, your coworker. Go ahead and have them subscribe as well because that's how we support the show and we can continue to do this each and every week. Now, after you subscribe, remember, we do the show live as well at uh, 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Fridays. Uh, you can also check us out at live.twit.tv if you want to watch the show live. And of course, if you want to jump into the chat room as well, we have a really great set of characters in the chat room giving us questions, having some good discussions. You can check that out at irc.twit.tv. Also, don't forget you can follow me at twitter.com slash luemm. We can check out all the work that I do here at Microsoft and all my little nitty-gritty projects that I do as well as don't forget Build 2019 next week. Check out all the streaming that's coming from that and all the great things that dev.office.com is going to show and, and give you to be able to extend Office. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa who continue to support us each and every week to do this show. We, we can't do the show without them. also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, including the engineers at Twit and, of course, our very own Mr. Brian Chi, who is also our tireless producer he does all the bookings. He gets all the plans for the show. We couldn't do it without him. So thank you to Brian. Uh, and of course, before we sign out, we have our TD for today, Alex. You know, Alex, you know the show tradition. Can you maybe give us the topic of to the show? Uh, it was something about um, shortening the latency as much as possible with uh, with those light-powered nanobots. <laughs> And so, so they the could take over bites, the world. The with, dust bite bots. Yes, the dust bite bots. So they could take over <laughs> the world with with low, super low latency. Yeah, okay. All right. Maybe we'll give you a point for that one. <laughs> but maybe next time we'll 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 get the actual the actual show. Okay, next time. Topic. Next time. Next time. Okay. Well until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Twitter.